This is the VR Workforce Studio. Inspiration, education, and affirmation. At work. The Workforce and Disability Employment Podcast from the Wilson Workforce and Rehabilitation Center, a division of the Virginia Virginia Department for Aging and Rehabilitative Services. Services. The VR Workforce Studio is published by our foundation at www.rcf.org and is available in in iTunes iTunes and at vrworkforcestudio.com. You are listening to the VR Workforce Studio. And so to anybody with a disability, you're exceptional. So when you look at these these obstacles that come in your life, don't look at them like, oh, my gosh, this is too much to overcome. You look at yourself and say that I can overcome this because I am a human, you know, that I'm an exceptional species, that I'm able to overcome an immovable object. And when I do do this, I can look back at myself and say that I am amazing. And that's the way you know you're amazing is over only by what you overcome, not by the things that go your way. VR Workforce Studio. On today's episode of the VR Workforce Studio, I hate it when people say I'm only human. The Brian Evans Story. Hi, I'm Rick Sizemore, Director of the Wilson Workforce and Rehabilitation Center. And I'm Ann Hudlow, Director of the WWRC Foundation. And together we are bringing you the inspiring and sometimes unbelievable success stories of vocational rehabilitation. We're celebrating the journeys of those brave and unstoppable individuals with disabilities who show us all that they're willing to do whatever it takes to overcome the obstacles to independence and employment and taking a closer look at how vocational rehabilitation provides the supports and assistance needed for success in disability employment. And Rick, no disability employment story can be complete without the champions of business and industry that hire individuals with disabilities. Or the professional rehabilitation counselors who've dedicated their lives and careers to helping individuals with disabilities to lead more productive and fulfilling lives while building up the workforce. Tracy Topoloski is a certified rehabilitation counselor and joins us as part of the Inspiration Showcase today to discuss her important work with Brian. Thank you, Rick. Good to be here. And later on today's show, we will have a special guest from the Commission on Rehabilitation Counselor Certification. Or as uh, Tracy might say, the CRCC. Scott Donnell is here to talk about the national organization that certifies rehabilitation counselors to do this great work. Welcome, Scott. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here, and I'm really looking forward to hearing Brian's story. Brian is standing by with what is an amazing story of his near-death motorcycle accident and the road to recovery, vocational rehabilitation, and his new perspective on life, not only as an individual with disability, but as the human who defines success by moving immovable objects. Simply unbelievable. All of this on today's episode. I hate it when people say I'm only human, the Brian Evans story. Here in the VR Workforce Studio. Brian Evans is currently employed at the Bank of America as a business consultant and spends much of his time talking with business owners who bank at Bank of America. He was bound for the Olympics as a star athlete in younger life until unanticipated medical complications prevented his pursuits and he became focused on the banking industry with a beautiful family, good job and a prosperous path to the future. Tragedy struck unexpectedly. Brian became one of almost 60 million people in America who have a disability. Brian, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Brian, let's get started with a discussion about your your disability. What's your story? So July 1st of 2015, uh, I was celebrating. I just got promoted at my job, uh, was becoming a VP, um, business consultant. So excited. Got all my, my friends together. We were going out. Was going to go celebrate. Um, I was like, everybody, let's go to the restaurant. I'm treating. Um, and I ride motorcycles. So I was debating, do I want to take my motorcycle? Do I want to drive my truck? And so I chose my motorcycle. I called one of my motorcycle buddies. We went down there and we had a ball. The problem was is that one of my motorcycle friends was um drinking and we said we don't do that but he drunk so much to the point that the police there told me hey did you ride up here with him and i was like yeah and he was like listen if he gets on his motorcycle we're gonna lock him up so um if you can can you make sure he doesn't get on that bike so i go over there and tell him i was like hey man what are you doing you can barely stand why are you why are you like 
plastered like that. And he was just like, man, I'm okay. You know, the police said they'd give me a ride home. I was like, they're going to give you a ride, but it's not going to be home. So I was just like, look, man, let me take your bike home. And, you know, you, you just ride with one of my friends and that's probably the safe thing to do. And he was like, no, nah, man, I got it. You know how I do. If I get, if I get, you know, on the bike and they chase me, I'm going to run. And I'm looking at him. He can't stand up. He could barely keep his posture. I was like, okay, let me see your keys. Let me get something out your bike. And I just took his bike and I got him a ride home. And then we got to his house and he was like, man, I'm so sorry. You're such a good big brother. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I was like, dude, you can't do that because you might end up dead or paralyzed, man. Like you got to be careful and take care of yourself. He's like, I'm so sorry. And I was just like, just, just watch yourself. And then I got back to my bike at this point. It's about two 30 in the morning um the, the restaurant's closing the police officers out there like that's a great job what you did man god bless you you know that that's such a good thing i was like i did that for a strange i mean i'm not gonna let him ride home drunk like that like thank you for letting me know and it was like have a good night man god bless you. and i was like god bless you too i jumped on my bike by myself never ride by myself and i'm on my way home i'm jumping on interstate 64 i did not get one mile away from the restaurant and I woke up underneath a guardrail, have no clue what happened. Don't know if somebody hit me. Don't know if my tire blew. Don't know if a deer jumped. Have no idea what happened. And I look and I see my bike down the highway and I'm like, huh, how'd that happen? And I was like, let me get up. And I'm like looking in the guardrails over top of me and I couldn't move. My legs wouldn't move. My hands wouldn't move. And I just started crying. And, you know, I was like, God, no, like, you know, why? I was trying to save someone else's life. How is this happening? And, you know, that was the start. That's how it happened. That was the night that my life changed. What happened in the days following your accident? All right. So um, I make it to MCV. I was in MCV ICU. At, um, it's MCV VCU, um, depending on who you ask. Um, I was in ICU. They were, you know, reluctant on doing the surgery because it was so much swelling and things going on. It's like we cannot operate on him as soon as he comes in here. So let's see if he survives. And, you know, a day or two later, we're going to do the surgery. So I have no idea. I was out for like two to three days. Um, I was told that like the whole city of Richmond was up in MCV, like praying for me. And everybody was just hugging me and holding on to me and just, you know, just hoping that I get better. Um, I was blessed enough that MCV VCU has amazing surgeons. And I think it was like 34 people that were working on me doing the surgery and they all came and met my wife and held her hand and told her we're going to do everything we can to save his life and not to worry um what happened was is that uh i was a uh, broke my neck i was a c6 c7 spinal injury um i broke my femur bone um that was coming out my leg protruding out my leg and i broke my knee um and i got nerve damage all along the right side of my body because i slid on the right side of my body um and they saved my life. Like I said, they, they were major surgeons. Um, they, they put me back together. And, you know, I thank God for these guys and women that were working at MCV VCU. And like I said, once again, my, my life started brand new all over again. So this truly was a near death experience. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I literally they didn't say how many times I, I, I came here and left and came here. But I think it was along the tunes of maybe twice that I died and they came back. They didn't have to resuscitate me. It was just like, you know, my heart was faint. It wasn't there. It come back. You know, it was like I was fighting along myself. Like it wasn't a situation that they had to come in there and fibrillize me. But um, they said I was leaving and coming back, you know, and I'll be honest with you in my experience. You know, they say when you die, you see lights, it gets bright. And it wasn't that it was like it was like a movie. It kept on cutting the black and then it'll come back and it'll cut black again. And I'll come back. And then I was just like, what's going on? The next thing I know, the last, the first thing I remember was the 4th of July. And I was looking out and all my family was around and I was on the top floor and I saw the fireworks, you know, and it was just like, wow, like how many days was I gone? And it was like, it's about two days. This is the second day you just came out of surgery and, you know, they, they, they saved you. And I'm, I'm telling you, like tra traumatic experiences like that change the way you look at life completely. Like, you know, um, and not to be too long winded about it, you know, I was very successful at Bank of America. I was like a very good performer. Um, they flew me to Florida, flew me to Texas, um, you know, I, on, on the company card, you know, doing all of that. And I'm thinking, man, I'm moving up. I've been there for 10 years. I'm finally it's starting to pay off. You know, all the hard work is really starting to manifest. And, you know, I thought I had it together. But, you know, what's funny is if you want to make God laugh, you tell him your plans, and, you know, because you have no clue what you're, you're in store for. So when this happened. And it was like I almost died like two times. I'm like, what did I accomplish in life? Like, really? You know, like I have a nice house, a beautiful family, you know, but, 
you know, God blessed me with so many other things. And, you know, I use that to, 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 for, for, you know, physical material things. And it's like, you know, life is so much more than material, physical things. It's, it's a lot deeper. And if you leave and that was what you was focusing on, that's just what you did. Nothing, you know, nobody remembers that. So when I thought about how close I was to death, you know, it's just like, wow, I really wasted my life. Like people say, yeah, you had a successful life, Brian, you did good. But when you almost die and you look back and you look at your body of work, the best thing I had was my family, my children, and how much time did I invest in them? You know, I was working, you know, talking to clients, talking to business owners. I gave them more time than I gave the things that God blessed me with. And so it made me really look at myself a lot. I had a lot of time. So many people in your situation, Brian, can remember a psychological low. It seems like this experience was more of a psychological awakening. Right, right. It was. Now, I will agree with you. It was a low because, you know, if you've been living for 35 years at that time, I was 35. Um, if you live for 35 years one way and then all of that changes, it's it's it, it does a lot to your psychological view of life. And it's like, man, I can't walk. I can't even use my hands. I can't feed myself. And all that stuff starts feeding into your mind. And you're like, what am I going to do? Like, who's going to love me now? Like, is my wife going to stay by me? Like, I'm thinking these things. I was blessed enough to have a wife that stand by me. But you don't know how shallow people may be in this world. And, you know, these things run through your mind. And you're looking in the hospital. And, you know, people visit you. And it's like everybody's there. And they're like, oh, what are you going to do, Brian? Oh, my gosh. You know, I can't believe this has happened. You're such a good guy. And you start buying into that. Like, why did this happen to me? I am a good guy. And it's like, that's where the low comes from. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I pray a lot and I believe in God. And, um, you know, I thank God that God has been rooted in my soul. So it's like when everybody's gone and when all of the people holding your hand are gone, it's just you in your head, just talking to God, like, what am I going to do next? And I'll be honest, this is this is really a conversation I had with God and I'll share it. I was talking to God. And I was like, God, you know, I'm 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 tall, dark and handsome. That's gone. I'm no longer tall, dark and handsome. I I, I don't know how I'm going to keep my job. And, you know, I, I can't walk anymore. I coach baseball and football with all the kids. What am I going to do with these kids? They're, they're looking for me to help them. I can't do any of that stuff. And God said the most important thing that I gave you, you still have. You still have your voice. You still have your ability to articulate how you feel. You still have your heart. You can still see. You can still hear. What's your problem? Like, you don't need any of that stuff to accomplish what I have you here to do. And when I heard that, it was like, wow, you know, that's true. You know, if I lost my voice or if I lost my mind, that would have been one thing. But I didn't lose that. I just lost legs and hands and, you know, those things you can compensate for. So it was just like when I realized that, that kind of sombered me and kind of relaxed me when I was going through my depression, which everybody goes through. And it's, it's human to do that. So that's that's how I first started the transition to, you know, grasping this thing. Let's continue from here to the place where the road to recovery and physical as well as vocational rehabilitation started. ICU, I was in ICU. We're getting ready to, um, you know, release me from that. I was there for like 11 days, I think. If I'm not mistaken, I was there for 11 days. It's like, Brian, what are you going to do next? Um, You know, you need to do some rehab immediately. Um you know there's these places you can go you got you know the shepherd center in atlanta and then you got us downstairs and it's like shepherd center got a long you know waiting list and you really don't want to go without you know rehab right after this you want to go straight into it so what do you want to do so i was like i guess i got to go to mcv rehab so they took me downstairs um you know they wanted to make sure that my mind was sound because i did a lot of, of trauma to the head but like i said god bless me saved me with the things that i needed the most so the, the vocational part, this is the funniest part about it all. I cleared that the fastest. Like I had to do speech. I had to do, um, you know, occupational. And I had to do physical therapy. And the speech, I did that in like two days. You know, the first day they were down, they were concerned. But it was because I was on so many pain meds and I was under so much medication. It was like, is he OK? But it was just they caught me when I was tired and I was on a lot of medication. I wasn't used to all that medication, but I passed speech. And that was the thing that kind of confirmed that, yeah, you did preserve the most important part of me. You know, what I love the most to do is talk, which you'll realize as we go on. Um, the, the physical therapy part and the occupational therapy part was rough. I was super weak. I, if you lay down on your back for 
14 days and don't do anything. It's amazing how quick your body deteriorates. It's, it's amazing. I, I lived in the gym. I worked out all the time and I could literally not hold my head up longer than like 20 seconds without you know, my neck hurting. It was like, what's going on? It could have been a neck trauma, but still how weak my body was. It, it was once again, took me to some lows because it kind of shocked me. Like it showed me how defenseless I was. I felt vulnerable. I felt weak. I felt like I couldn't protect myself. You know, and before the accident, I was a guy that, you know, if I saw any type of injustice, I felt like I had to step in there and do something, you know, emotionally, physically, something. I just felt like I was a protector. Now I felt like I needed to be protected. So, you know, going through that part, the physical therapy and occupational therapy was really like hard at the beginning because I didn't have a lot to work with. You know, um, OT, I didn't know how to use my hands. Um, So literally everything I had to do uh, from scratch, starting over. Um, I needed a lot of adaptive equipment. Um, I needed a lot of um, like nurse assistance, you know, and I wasn't used to that. So having a stranger in your face like all the time was kind of like, you know, it, it humbled me, number one. But it also got a re- got away of a lot of my pride and a lot of my ego. You know, you, you, you feel very, you know, independent. And then when that's taken away from you, you know, you kind of don't really have a lot of pride inside of you anymore. You know, you got a person undressing you. You got a person dressing you. You know, all of these things happen and you're like, you know, I'm, I feel like a grown baby. You know, I felt like an adult baby. And, you know, it took a lot to get over that, you know. So the occupational, the vocational part, the vocation, the, the speech part was quick. The physical and occupational therapy part was a journey. It started really rough at the beginning. And that journey brought you to the Wilson Workforce and Rehabilitation Center, sometimes called WWRC, and by our former name, Woodrow Wilson. Thank God. I'm not going to lie. I heard about you guys and it was like, they, they said Woodrow Wilson. And I was like, Oh, what's that? And it was like, well, that's a place in Virginia out in the mountains that they do amazing work. And I was like, Oh wow. Out in the mountains. And I was like, well, let's do that. And it was like, well, you got to go through DARS and you know, it's a waiting list and there's a lot of people that want to go there and stuff. And it was just a whole lot. It felt like this Shepherd Center situation. Like you're not going to get there right now. Plus you have to heal. You can't go there right now because you're just, you're way too bad off right now. But they, they did bring that up to me. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you how awesome God is. Um, I went to MCV. I was there for three months and then I still wanted to do physical therapy and stuff. So they put me in a nursing home that um, had physical therapy there. So I was there for 30 days and then I abruptly got kicked out of there because insurance was like, oh, we can't pay for this. So they sent me home and I wasn't ready for that. So when I was home, we wasn't really set up for me to be there. My family wasn't really trained good on how to take care of a quadriplegic. Um, it was rough. I started getting depressed. I, I mean, I was the toll of my family. My wife, she was, you know, thinking, I don't know if I can do this. My kids, they were looking at me like, oh, what's wrong with that? It was just, it was very hard. But here's how God works. My mother-in-law found Tracy's number. I don't know how they got her number, um, but I called her and I was like, hey, I really want to go here. And she grabbed that thing by the horns and reached out to my my counselor in Richmond, who was also also a very amazing woman, Rebecca. And they worked together and they got me here in like 30 days. Like it went from me not knowing what I was going to do to coming to Woodrow Wilson in 30 days. And when I got here, oh, my gosh, it it was like it was like a second chance at life. And the only reason I say that is because um, everybody here is you know, dealing with some type of, you know, disability. And when they see you, they don't look at you like you're a quadriplegic. They look at you like another client. It's just another person here. And it feels normal here. I'm normal. I want to say I'm, I'm not saying because I'm disabled, I'm not normal, but I didn't want to go out in public. I didn't want, like being around crowds. I was very like, I'm a very outspoken person. I'm a very, you know, mix it up with everybody type of person. After the accident, I was none of that. And it took me coming here to get back into being myself. And you're back. I'm back. I am. I'm Brian 5.0, actually, because, you know, when you go through stuff like that, you learn how to deal with, um, you know, rejection, stress, abandonment. You know, these are things you didn't have to deal with when everything was when you had the world, you know, in your hands. Like, you know, I'm in the prime of my life. Everything was working for me. And then we have to relearn all this stuff. and You really see how life can be, how cold it can be, you know, overcoming that makes you way a much better person. I'm a much better person. Let's talk about your job and what you were doing before the accident and about your employment after disability. 
Um, I'm a business consultant for Bank of America. I started out as a small business consultant, which means my um, my, my business owners would do anywhere from 50000 in process in a year to about... I think it was three million. That was my max that I could deal with as far as your process and volume. When I say process and volume, I'm a business consultant with merchant services. Anything that you do with a business that requires a credit card payment, somebody has to set you up so you can accept Visa, MasterCard, Discovery, American Express. Um, and it's normally through banks or through um, vendors that also, also offer like card services. So what I did was very important to Bank of America. Um, I started out with that. Um, came in there. I was always working in mortgages. I've been a realtor for since 2002. Um, did a lot of real estate with Bank of America, Wachovia. Um, I worked for the city of Richmond once upon a time. A uh, lot of real estate gear type of work. Somebody saw me doing that. It's like, you're a real good talker. You should come over here and, and do merchant services because, you know, it's about relationship building. And when a person trusts you, they'll normally bring their money over to Bank of America like that. We could use you. So they talked me into doing it and I turned out to be one of the best. Like I was the rookie of the year. Everybody's like, oh my gosh, who is this guy? You know, and it was just once again, what I said before, God gave me an ability to, 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 talk to people and really get personable with people. You didn't feel like you was talking to a bank. You felt like you were talking to, you know, somebody that you've known all your life, even if I talked to you for five minutes. So that's what made me excel at being a, a business consultant. Um, speed it up about two years later, you know, I, I did so good that they wanted to promote me to uh, like the upper tier, which is three million above. Very demanding is very, you know, goal, goal driven. But that's how that job works. And that's something that I pride myself on being successful at and um, actually excelling at. Um, after the accident happened, my job loves me so much. I've been there for 10 years. I know literally everybody at Bank of America corporate. Um, they was only supposed to hold my job for three months on FMLA. They didn't want me to lose my job. So they put me on leave of absence for a year. And people were working you know, hours so that I could keep my benefits. You know, they were working so I could keep getting commissions. They were giving their deals to me while I was in the hospital. People were donating money, you know, at Bank of America. We had a bake sale. Um, people were buying cupcakes for $500. Yeah, yeah seriously. It was, I, I got so blessed. And they held my job for a year. And ironically, I'm coming back on the 1st of July ready. Thanks to Woodrow Wilson, I'm totally ready. And I'm not able to do what I did because he filled that position, unfortunately. So I'm no longer a vice president. I'm assistant vice president. Um, which is just a title, you know, and I can work my way back up, but I got a chip on my shoulder. So it's like, now I got to come back and show them how you do it. You know, so I'm a, um, assistant vice president. I'm still a business consultant. I don't know exactly where my threshold of clients are going to be. They're probably going to be 50,000 back to 3 million again. Um, but who knows? I might be able to talk to more, um, higher volume, um, processing clients. I just want to come up in there um, I made so many new improvements with my own self spiritually and, and within myself that I'm ready for whatever, you know, comes my way now. And I think that when I come up in there, not only because of my circumstances, I'm going to inspire other people to be better, but I'm going to show myself perseverance and, and a positive atti attitude. Brian, what kinds of vocational rehabilitation, assistive technology or accommodations did you need to get back to work? OK, you guys figured out for me that drag and dictate would be huge for me because I'm um, because of my hands, I'm not able to write. And um, you do need to write down what you're talking to the clients about um, and, and do it pretty fast. So I'm going to be using drag and dictate. Um, which is like a dictate software. Um, you speak into it, it types down, you know, what you're saying. Um, I'm also using, um, well, Doris came with me to do a worksite evaluation and he looked at the office and so he required me to have an office that has a door because my office didn't have a door. But for background noises to, to drown it out, I needed something that could be isolated and quiet so that dictate could learn my voice. So I'm gonna get an office with a door, which don't have a problem with that. Um, they're going to give me a desk that raises and lowers. Uh, we're going to work on the doors having an automatic opener like that you, you hit and it'll open up on its own. Um, the bathroom doors, a little bit different just because the building is um, a corporate building. So it's kind of hard to um, manipulate the bathrooms because they're all um, they all they all pretty much have the same layout. So it's kind of hard to change that. But um, what they're going to do is a buddy system, which is, hey, Brian's got to use the bathroom. Somebody open the door for him. Whatever, you know. Well, I have no problem with that. Um, and lastly, but not least, um, Dars is also going to help me get a vehicle so I can get back and forth to work with adaptive equipment on it. Um, the hand controls, um, the tripod for the steering wheel, um, lowered floors. And um, 
I, I, I really I'm excited because once again, those are all I need. I don't need a whole lot, you know, because I really I was taught by another quadriplegic. The less assistance that you can use, the better you're going to be, because sometimes you're not going to have these things. And you don't want to be too dependent on a lot of adaptive equipment if you can help it. So the stuff that they offer me is going to change my quality of life tremendously. Um, but I also want to make sure I can use, you know, try to be as normal or not normal. I want to try to make sure I can use the things that are out there that, that aren't adaptive for me and, and get good at that. So just in case anything happens, I'm still independent. Brian, this is a question that I ask most guests on this show. What advice would you have for an employer who is thinking of hiring someone with a disability? All right. For the employers, I would say don't look at a person with a disability. Look at the qualified applicant. You know, my disability doesn't change the fact that I'm good at what I do. Um, and if you really want to be like technical with it, a disability means you're not able to do something. So it's not the fact that I can't walk. You're not able to do something. So you could look at the employer. They might not be able to, you know, cater towards this particular client that makes them disabled in some shape, form or fashion. You know, so when I talk about a disability, you know, I don't want you to look at an a, a associate as he can't walk. So, you know, that's going to be a problem. Am I qualified? Yes. Am I able to do the job? Yes. That's all that matters. You want to you want to uh, able employee. You don't really look at the disability part because that has nothing to do with what I'm able to bring to the company. And so that's what I would say to them. And then lastly, what I would say is, you know, I consider myself exceptional. I say this to anybody with a disability. You're an exceptional being like a human being is very amazing in so many facets of life. Like when people say I'm only human, I hate when they say that because that means you're talking about the less of what a human is. But a human can do anything. We can fly to the moon. We can make airplanes. We can make cars. We can, you know, break down what an atom is. We're very we're a very unique species. So we're exceptional. And in order for you to be an exceptional, exceptional person, you only can measure that by overcoming immovable objects. So it's like with me. I think I'm exceptional, but how do I know that if I've never been challenged in life? And so this is a challenge and I'm overcoming it because I'm exceptional. And this is how I measure how I am, how God made me. And so to anybody with a disability, you're exceptional. So when you look at these these obstacles that come in your life, don't look at them like, oh, my gosh, this is too much to overcome. You look at yourself and say that I can overcome this because I am a human. You know, that I'm an exceptional species, that I'm able to overcome an immovable object. And when I do do this, I can look back at myself and say that I am amazing. And that's the way you know you're amazing is over only by what you overcome, not by the things that go your way. Brian, we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. Let me say you are one of the most amazing guests I've ever had the honor of interviewing. Uh, give us your final thoughts, if you would, on vocational rehabilitation and your return to work. I would not wish this on my worst enemy being a, dis, um, a quadriplegic. But now that I'm here, you know, I thank God for the resources that were available to me. I thank God for coming to Woodrow Wilson and learning how to love life again, like to learn how to, to, to engage in life again. Um, overcoming, you know, the fear of going back to work, knowing that I am a regular person, that I am just like anybody else, that I am a human and that I can not overcome anything that comes my way just by having a positive outlook on it. So from the beginning to the end, I am thankful because I had a positive. And this is something I also want to say to people with disabilities. When you're positive, you're more likely to overcome an obstacle than when you're not positive. And the reason I say that is, is that because when you're positive, you attract people that are willing to help you when you're not positive you kind of repel them away and you never know what's around the corner to make your life better unless you engage with it with a positive outlook and so you know it, I, I know that's easier said than done to anybody for disability but try your hardest to stay positive positive. and the reason I say that is because you know you attract more flies with honey than you do a vinegar and I've, that's what I live by. And that's why I'm here. And that's why I'm going back to work. And that's why I'm going to be successful. And that's why I'm going to speak. And I'm going to uplift anybody that has an ear to listen to it. And I encourage you to do the same thing. Brian, thank you for being on the podcast today. And best of luck to you and all you do in 2016 and beyond. Thank you for having me. Tracy Topoloski is a certified rehabilitation counselor who works for the Virginia Department for Aging and Rehabilitative Services and leads efforts to work with consumers like Brian. Uh, Tracy, in Brian's interview, he talked about connecting with you as a first step in coming to 
the Wilson Workforce and Rehabilitation Center. Tracy, what was it like working with Brian? Brian is probably one of the most motivated people I've ever met. Um, he he has a really good direction in his life. He knows that he's going to be successful, and he actually is looking at his um, medical crisis as um, an opportunity almost because he realizes that he has a lot of strengths that um, haven't really been tapped into with his current job, even though he really enjoys his current job and has been extremely successful. I think that he realizes that, that um, he has additional strengths as well as that and is interested in being able to spread the word and kind of pay it forward, possibly. Tracy, as a certified rehabilitation counselor, you, of course, have a specialized skill set. And oftentimes you're connecting with folks like Brian inside medical facilities. What does the CRC mean as you're out working with other professionals? It gives you the the respect that someone in the field um, would need to be able to work beside physicians and nurses and social workers and the other folks. Tracy, we have Scott Donnell uh, with us via Skype from his office in Illinois. I can see him in the monitor. Hi, Scott. It's nice to see you. Again, welcome, Scott. Thank you for having me, and, and hello to everybody out there. Scott, we've just had a chance to hear from Brian. Do you have any reflections on uh, Brian's story? I just thought it was so inspirational. I mean, you've got a gentleman here who had such a change, a drastic change uh, that forever uh, – you know, changed his life. And I think that to have somebody with that spirit who's able to uh, talk so positively about what he can still do with his life is, is absolutely terrific. And it also reflects, I think, on Tracy as well, because uh, the work that she has done with Brian, and, and I respect uh, rehabilitation counselors, in particular those that are CRCs, but rehabilitation counselors just do a remarkable job and have such a unique skill set. And I think she's done great work with him. Scott, what is the history and the main focus of CRCC? Well, as many of your listeners probably know, uh, CRCC has been around for a long time. It's the Commission on Rehabilitation Counselor Certification. It was founded in 1974, and it is, in fact, the world's largest rehabilitation counseling organization. And it's dedicated to improving the lives of people with disabilities, and we do this by certifying rehabilitation counselors at the master's level. And this is setting the standard for competent delivery of quality rehabilitation counseling services through the exam that we give these people. Scott, it seems to me our world and our profession and the way we communicate is changing so rapidly and has changed over the last few years. How is CRCC moving into the future to meet the needs of counselors and the rehabilitation community? I think uh, when you look at 2012, 2013, I think that uh, CRCC realized that they had to make some changes uh, beyond just the one product that they were offering. And so they brought me in in 2013 to uh, develop the marketing program. At the same time, we also worked on products and services, and we did a lot of research, not only with our CRCs, but also with rehabilitation counselors in general, to try to figure out uh, what we needed to do to expand our products and services in order to increase awareness of and, and also the demand for the certification. And what that has done, in fact, is all of that research has led to products and services which now include what we call the CRCC community. And that is the first online community built exclusively to serve all rehabilitation counseling professionals. And it has three components to that. And the first one is our online job board, which we call CRCC Aspire. And that helps connect employers who hire rehabilitation counseling professionals to our CRCs and also our CRC applicants, uh, those people who are currently in the process of achieving certification. So they have that exclusivity uh, to put their resumes out there online on that job board and employers are able to go in and really find the, the, the best of the best. The second part is the online professional networking platform, and that is what we call CRCC Engage. And this was actually created to empower our subscribers, all of our, not just CRCs, but rehabilitation counselors in general, to create meaningful, engaging dialogue amongst themselves. And what we've seen just in the first year, we have over 3,000 participants currently on CRCC Engage. They've created over, you know, 1,000 discussion uh, threads. They've, you know, 
just been actively involved in in bringing more people into uh, discussion of various topics on rehabilitation counseling, and we're we're seeing a lot of positives for that, and 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 seeing it uh, kind of you know mushroom and grow. And then the third part of this, which is what I really wanted to uh, talk a little bit about today, is CRCCE University, which is an online learning community, and it's an inactive, it's interactive, it's dynamic, it's an engaging format, and it is going to, we think, be a game changer for continuing education for rehabilitation counseling. So, Scott, what are some of the highlights we can look forward to? You know, what's exciting for us is we're having the opportunity to really create content for continuing education that delivers real-world application. And I think this is what's going to set us apart in terms of the quality of what we're offering. You know, it's not only is it affordable, but it's also high quality in terms of, you know, rehabilitation counselors being able to take what they learn and apply it immediately to their work setting. And that's that's a big game changer right there. Uh, But, you know, we are going to be offering a whole array of courses uh, when we uh, lead this off in the next couple of weeks. And, you know, it's going to cover everything from ethics to job placement to multicultural counseling, transition services, and we're going to be adding courses, you know, on and on as we go along. So there'll probably be about 10 courses that will be offered when when we launch. Uh, The great part is that we have created a promotional plan which allows for anyone to come into the university and take a course for free a one-hour course they take it for free there's no risk there's no obligation you don't have to buy anything you get one hour of ce credit and then if you really like uh what you're seeing from crcc university in terms of the the quality and the content you can sign up for an introductory subscription for one year uh, we give you a 20 percent discount on that you also get two free CE credits. Uh, in addition to that, that allows you to save 40% on all of your actual course purchases. So it kind of pays for itself within two or three courses when uh, when you when you kind of look at and do the math. But uh, we're excited about being able to offer something that we feel is affordable, it's quality, and it's also very, very convenient, particularly for CRCs because they get to upload all of their uh, continuing education directly to their account, which means there's no more paperwork involved. You know, they, usually if you're, you're trying to do this and you're trying to get your renewal done for certification, you're running around trying to find your paperwork and whatever. Now you don't have to do that anymore. Uh, tell us where we can reach you, Scott. Yeah, you can uh, reach out to myself, Scott Donnell, uh, Director of Marketing and Strategic Alliances at CRCC at 847-944-1304. And you can contact me uh, through my email at sdonnell at crccertification.com. Thanks, Scott. We wish you and the team at CRCC the very best and appreciate you being on today's show. All right. Listen, thanks, Rick. I really appreciate it. And it's been a wonderful show. Thank you to the foundation and the team of people behind you that are supporting us. Rick, thank you. This has been a great show. It is an honor to be a part of this. And if you would like information on the WWRC Foundation, please visit us online at WWRCF.org. I'm Ann Hudlow. And I'm Rick Sizemore. If you'd like to know more about WWRC, you can find us at wwrc.virginia.gov. Until next time, won't you join us in creating hope and a path forward? And we'll see you next time here in the VR Workforce Studio. VR Workforce Studio. Inspiration, education, and affirmation at work. The Workforce and Disability Employment Podcast from the Wilson Workforce and Rehabilitation Center, a division of the Virginia Department for Aging and Rehabilitative Services. The VR Workforce Studio is published by our foundation at wwrcf.org and is available in iTunes and at vrworkforcestudio.com. Support for the WWRC Foundation comes from the Virginia Manufacturers Association, creating the best business environment in the United States for world-class advanced technology businesses to manufacture and headquarter their companies for maximum productivity and profitability. And CVS Health, helping people find their path to better health.